Well, thank you all very much uh, for coming here this morning. I'm Mark Canty, and I'm a senior advisor here at CSIS. Uh, first of all, I want to make uh, an administrative announcement in the unlikely event of an emergency. I'll give you instructions about how to evacuate the building. We'll either go through the front door back there, over there, or the back door. And having got that out of the way, uh, let me uh, uh, engage with our uh, topic this morning, uh, strategy formulation. As many of you know, uh, DOD has begun its strategy formulation uh, process, quite deep into it. Um, there's a lot of uncertainty. This time, there's always a lot of uncertainty, of course, but there's uncertainty first in a fiscal dimension because we have tensions between deficit hawks, defense hawks, and uh, domestic advocates. We also have uncertainty on the strategic dimension because of many of the things, of course, the president said while uh, campaigning, um, uh, raising fundamental questions about U.S. national security policy. Uh, all of this uncertainty, of course, is great for us in the think tank world because we get to write about lots of very interesting things. It makes the task of strategy formulation uh, a bit more difficult. People sometimes ask, well, why is strategy formulation important? I mean, isn't it strategy, the output of this process that really, uh, that really matters? And our argument is that the strategy formulation process decides what kinds of options uh, the leadership is going to uh, consider, what kind of analysis uh, gets done, who participates in the process and how they participate. So a good process can facilitate the production of a good strategy and help the process of getting it adopted in a highly political environment. Let me take a couple of minutes to set the stage. I'll give a few highlights from our uh, recently completed study, then I'll ask our panelists to come on up and uh, give their uh, perspectives. I, I think we've handed out copies of the slides. I'm only going to talk to a couple of them. Feel free to ask questions about any of the other slides if you, uh, if you have questions there. And of course, it's all uh, online. OK, can I get the next uh, slide? OK, great. The recent debate has been driven primarily by Senator McCain and the uh, Senate Armed Services Committee, although uh, many people, uh, many uh, committees have participated. About two years ago, he held a series of hearings about management in the Department of Defense, and maybe 50 or so uh, experts testified during that process, and they raised a lot of issues with the strategy formulation process, as well as many other uh, management processes in DOD. There were a lot of complaints about the process. You can see uh, many of them here. People in the community are well uh, familiar with these, uh, these uh, complaints. Uh, but you can see that two things that, that come through are uh, this lowest common denominator uh, kind of approach, watered down priorities, uh, and slowness. OK, next slide. One result of this was a direction for an independent study, and that's the study that uh, CSIS did. You can see the process here, which I don't want to go into uh, now, but uh, two things I do want to note at the bottom there, the CSIS study concept, because we wanted to do two things. First, we wanted to make this useful to policymakers. That's uh, you know, the precept, really, for uh, think tanks to try to be helpful to the pro policy uh, process. Uh, and we also didn't want to get sad, sidetracked by arguing over what the strategy should be. We really wanted to focus on strategy formulation and help the administration with that. Next slide. Here I just want to focus on the right side there, the changes, because as a result of this series of hearings and the discussion, the Congress made a wide variety of changes to all of the strategy documents. On the right there, you can see a synopsis of those changes. The one I want to focus on is the bottom right there. The QDR, of course, has been changed to the National Defense Strategy. The Congress reduced the number of required topics, wanted the department to focus on prioritization and getting it done quickly. It also required that the document be classified. And in fact, many of the 
changes that the Congress instituted required classification with the hope that that would uh, allow the documents to be more candid about priorities and trade-offs. Uh, next slide. So now we've got, that we've gone through some of the, the background here, let me talk about the insights and recommendations that uh, we came up with. And the four overall um, recommendations you can, you can see here. The first one is that there's a lot of latitude uh, in the new congressional uh, direction. I noted earlier that the Congress had reduced the number of required elements from 26 to uh, six. This gives the department a lot of uh, latitude in shaping the process. It doesn't have to do uh, the QDR uh, again. And I, our understanding is that the department has used that flexibility. The second point is recognizing the inherent political nature of, of the process. Uh, although the staffs, of course, that put this product together are highly technical and uh, highly skilled, ultimately the product is a statement about an administration's position and that statement is being made in a highly political environment and you just can't get around the politics of that. It also means that no matter what strategy comes out, they're all going to ha uh, face bitter opposition because it's the nature uh, of, the, of the environment. And the fact of bitter opposition doesn't mean that it was successful or unsuccessful. Uh, the third, limiting the proliferation of strategy documents. You know, every issue advocate wants to have their own strategy or roadmap. The problem is that when you multiply these, uh, you uh, let uh, people then cherry pick because the documents are never fully uh, in sync. And our recommendation, as you can see up, up here, is to limit at what the secretary signs and to make these documents as consistent as possible. And the final point is to seize the opportunity to drive change. The opportunity, the window for making changes is widest, uh, open widest, at the beginning of administration. And with time, administrations uh, make decisions and reduce the amount of flexibility they, they have. So getting this product done quickly uh, uh, is an, uh, an administration's greatest opportunity to make change. Okay. Next. In the report, we uh, identified 12 key choices for uh, administrations in developing a strategy process. I'm not going to go through all 12. I'm just going to focus on two, but I do want to note uh, the variety of key decisions that we, uh, that we had identified. Okay, let me give, have the next one. I want to make uh, two points here. Uh, the first is that the congressional language, the new congressional language, structures this process as the secretary giving guidance to the department. That's unlike the QDR where it was structured as the department explaining what it was uh, planning to do. So the secretary is clearly in, in charge and to make the process work, the secretary has to be in charge uh, um, um, in reality and as well as uh, in theory. The however is an important one though because the chairman has independent authorities arising from his position as um, principal military advisor to the president and the secretary of, of defense. So there's always some tension there between the civilian staff and the joint staff arising from this different set of authorities. And making that linkage is always uh, challenging. There are ways to, to do that, they're linking at different uh, stages, different levels uh, of the process. Tends to be personality dependent, and here the Secretary Mattis and uh, General Dunford have a good relationship. I mean, they've served together for many years, so that may make this relationship a little easier, but it's never going to be uh, uh, easy. The bottom bullet is important, though. I mean, as you're all, I think, aware, this is a, because it's a political document, you have, the secretary has to have this, the uh, chairman on board with whatever the product is at the end. If the chairman can't sign up to it, then it's just not going to be viable. Next slide. Outside advisors, we looked at this because there have been different 
uh, approaches to using outside advisors. And when we looked at other countries, for example, France and the United Kingdom, they brought uh, outside advisors in in a much more uh, deliberate and aggressive way the United States has done in the past. We have two suggestions here. One is to think about red teaming. Secretary Mattis has done that in the past, and it can be very helpful in uh, opening the, uh, you know, the, the competition of ideas. And the other is having some individuals or groups look at the final product before it goes out to give, again, some, um, um, to sort of test the, the justifications and give some, uh, some feedback before it goes out to the wider community. It was also clear as we looked at some of the case studies that outside groups can't do the work. In other words, they can't substitute for the, uh, you know, the, the internal cells. They can give, they're very good at giving advice, very uh, uh, not so good about making uh, trade-offs. All right, next one, and I think it's the last one. All right, and we're good on time. Uh, two of these are, are, are aimed at encouraging the, the Congress to wait and see how this process plays out before uh, reforming it again. Uh, the Congress can, can sometimes be impatient in uh, um, uh, driving uh, re reforms. So we suggest, all right, see what the products are, then do uh, some studies about the products, and then uh, make whatever further changes the, uh, you think are, are uh, uh, warranted. The last point is discussed in the report, but in a much more tactful way than I put it up here. And that is, you know, the Congress asked for a product that has clear priorities, that makes trade-offs, uh, and articulates what the, uh, um, the administration proposes to do and not do. The Congress then cannot turn around and punish the department for producing a report that in fact does that because inevitably there are going to be winners and losers and people who don't like the results. Now, the fact that there's debate and criticism, I and mean, that's part of living in, in a democracy. But if the Congress uh, takes it a step further and makes personal attacks or punishes DOD in some way for uh, the results of this um, uh, study, then the department next time is going to be much less candid about its trade-offs and will end up back to where we were before, where the cr Congress criticized the department for uh, bland documents that didn't give clear insights about where it was headed. And the final question there, which will we'll play out, is how much does the Congress really care about this? You know, will they, if they're unhappy with the results, will they prescribe a strategy formulation process that is as um, detailed and uh, uh, as prescribed as the acquisition process, or will they let the process go pretty much as, as it is, you know, offering their advice and counsel uh, but not uh, narrowly uh, defining the process. And when we talked to people, we got uh, answers on both sides, so we'll, we'll see how that uh, plays out. So with that, I'd like to ask my panel to come up and take their seats. We're very honored to have a distinguished group here with us this morning. All of them are veterans of uh, many strategic reviews and um, um, many uh, decision points in the department. We have uh, Andy Hohen here on my left, who's a senior vice president uh, at RAND for research and analysis. Previously served as the uh, RAND vice president for Project Air Force, and before that, in a stint in government, was a deputy assistant secretary um, for uh, strategy. Uh, to his left, we have Christine Wormuth, who's um, a former vice president here at CSIS, and before that, uh, very recently, the Undersecretary of Defense for Policy, uh, and now the head of the uh, ARSHT, is it pronounced? The ARSHT Center for Resiliency over at the Atlantic Council. And then to her left, we have uh, General uh, Robert Rooster Schmidl, who, uh, when in government, was the head of Marine Aviation, deputy head of CAPE, that is the Cost Assessment and Program Evaluation uh, Office in OSD, and Deputy Head of uh, uh, Cybercom, and now at Endgame, I understand. So with that,
Why don't I turn to my left here to uh, Andy and ask him to make his comments and give us a, his thoughts. Great. Thank you, Mark, um, uh, for the opportunity. I see a number of friends and colleagues in the, in the audience here, so uh, I look forward to the discussion today. First, I want to say congratulations to you and your team on this uh, new product. Uh, it's, uh, I think it's great to have this kind of report focusing not only on the what of strategy, but the how and, uh, and how to think about that. And I think you've uh, done a great service to us. And also, uh, it's a pleasure to be here with Christine and, uh, uh, and General Schmidl. It's uh, you know, terrific to share the stage. I think our focus today is more on substance or more on process than substance. But I don't think we can divorce substance from this discussion. And you know, for me, I think uh, we have to look at the situation in which strategy is being formulated. And you know, when I look at this environment now, I look back and experiences that I had in 89 and 90 as we were working on the base force and the regional defense strategy, and then in 93 on the bottom-up review. In 97, the first QDR, in 2001, the, the second QDR, and so forth. And we've all had those experiences. Um, for those two decades, I would argue that um, the two decades that followed the Cold War, fundamental US strategy was consistent and largely unchanged. Consistent and largely unchanged. It aimed to maintain US primacy through an inclusive strategy of growth of the global liberal order two decades uh, in which I think the basic assumptions about the role in the world had been settled and remained largely unchallenged. That meant expanding the democratic peace. It meant opening the global economy to all participants. It meant checking and precluding major competitors. And it also meant, very importantly, maintaining and expanding US security ties. Uh, the reviews that I participated in and the strategy formulation all embraced those ideas. I think there was, we could look at President Obama's experience, and I think for a time he was tempted perhaps to go in somewhat of a different direction, I, you know, arguing and, and to make a point of perhaps a bit of a blend of neo-isolationism, you know, the, the talk about nation building at home, and an emphasis on cooperative security, that is, you know, the idea of working with and through allies to achieve objectives. But he, too, I think, came to embrace the notion, the basic notion of primacy. And so although those ideas sort of were, were inside the administration, I think President Obama was very consistent on that. What we have today, though, with President Trump is perhaps, and I'll underline perhaps, the sharpest break since the end of the Cold War in terms of basic U.S. objectives. It's, it's, uh, we don't know yet how things will unfold. As Mark pointed out, we've got various processes underway. We're waiting on a national security strategy. The Defense Department's underway with its work. The other executive branches and agencies are doing their reviews. But we have certainly the notion of challenging some basic objectives um, in a way that we haven't seen in over 20 years. Uh, in many ways, I would argue that the debates up until this point were largely about means and not about ends. Um, and, and this, by the way, was also true throughout much of the Cold War. The arguments were largely about means and not about ends. Now, however, we're having a basic debate about a fundamental debate about ends. We can see this in the administration, and we can see differences that are unfolding here. We can see it between the administration and the Congress. And I think we can also see it in the wider public debate. And so this time, although our focus here is on process, I think the substance of these reviews is quite different. And I would argue here that it will be difficult to be clear about ultimate strategy until we have much cl greater clarity about ends. That is that the debate about America's role in the world needs to be resolved before we can meaningfully discuss how our diplomatic military and economic power can be aligned behind a set of coherent, widely supported goals. I think a lot of that is up for debate right now. So now back to process in terms of how we're thinking and looking at, at uh, various issues. I very much support the recommendations that were made in this report. 
uh, when Mark noted that uh, you know, the issues of aligning process to the decision maker, very important in terms of my experiences, recognizing the inherently political uh, nature of the process, no question about that, and we should never doubt that these are ultimately decisions about our that our political leadership need to make. Then the recommendation about limiting the proliferation of strategy do documents, I read that as let's not dilute the focus that we're having on, on main strategy choices by having so many different documents that have different interpretations about ultimate results. And then certainly the focus about seizing opportunities to drive leadership priorities. I do want to come back to um, uh, an earlier comment though, that it is important that the leadership understand the type of choices it is contemplating. So in light of those recommendations, I think we need to be clear and the leadership needs to be clear that it is now having a debate about fundamental objectives. And until we arrive at clarity among those um, and alignment among those, so clarity about objectives and alignment of the leadership, and here I'm talking about the executive branch and the Congress behind a coherent set of goals. Um, absent that, we're gonna have confusion, and confusion will be abundant. And I think we risk that right now in terms of some of the debates we have. We see different ideas coming out of different parts of the executive branch, Congress challenging various ideas. There's no question that this is an inherently political process, but I think there's also no question that we're having a debate about fundamental goals. And those need to be resolved if we're gonna have to be able to focus and align on strategy itself. Now, now just a few reflections on some of the, the recommendations in the report. And I just, as Mark did, I'm gonna pick out a couple as well. Uh, who runs the process is one of the question marks in there. And what is the right civil military balance? I think the report has this one just right. Um, in terms of the work DOD does. There's no question the Secretary of Defense needs to run this process. There's no question the Secretary of Defense will turn to trusted advisors to do it. Also no question about the role of the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff and the Joint Staff in this. I would add one comment, at least from my experiences, however, and that is it would be a mistake to think that the Chairman, and particularly the Joint Staff, speak for the military services. I think in any kind of process, the military services need to be uh, involved. They need to have a voice, and very importantly, the top leadership of the military services need to have a voice in terms of any decisions that are gonna be rendered. Any time that you're not sort of including the services, I think that the secretary is going to have a, a shortfall in terms of his or her knowledge of, of, of the real choices that are being made and they run the risk of lack of alignment in terms of any, any outcomes that are, or decisions that are ultimately taken. As I mentioned earlier, if we don't have clarity and we don't have alignment, then confusion is going to reign. And in this case of the Department of Defense, I think having the chiefs involved in the ultimate decisions is, is necessary for alignment and, and, and necessary for avoiding any kind of confusion that comes later. Should we, another of the choices that were, that were raised here is, should the focus be on establishing clear priorities or aspirational goals? I think clearly most of us would side on the notion of aspirational goal or on, on clear priorities. But I would argue that there's a further interpretation I'd give to this. I wouldn't just look at any kind of a strategy document, be it classified or unclassified, as the end result. The end result ultimately are the choices that are being made in terms of resource priorities. That is the budgets that are submitted. And therefore, if I were gonna judge in terms of a product that's coming out of one of these reviews, I would certainly look at the, 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 the description of the strategy itself, but you certainly have to have the companion, um, that is the budget that's gonna be supporting those. And so to me, I would urge that we look at the package of results, that is the strategy and the budget that accompanies it in terms of the choices that are being made and how those were, how those were ultimately reflected. Um, how often to conduct a strategy review? I thought the, um, uh, there was a very good um, point made in this that each new administration has to tackle a review and you should only uh, sort of undertake these when, after that, when situations have changed. 
I think that there was sort of an artificial nature of some of the reviews I participated in where the administration really wasn't looking to make any changes, but it did have a congressional requirement to undertake a new review. Um, and so it went through the motions. Certainly every new administration has choices to make. It has policy to set. This is the right environment to do it. There is a certain irony to this, though, that although the latitude, as Mark made in his opening remarks, that the latitude for every new administration is greatest in its earliest days, I think the irony is its ability to render decisions and come to conclusions are probably most difficult. Um, we, you don't have all the senior appointees in place. Um, these often, these are people that, are, that are, are forming a team, just getting to know each other. There are differences among executive department agencies and so forth. So the ability to come to both achieve clarity and alignment um, while necessary is very difficult to arrive at um, and early in an administration. Uh, last, um, for me, when to publish results. And I realize this is sort of an arcane detail, but I wanted to raise it because it was my experience that although there is an argument to be made for getting the results out earlier rather than later, I do think there is also an argument to be made that an, an administration ought to have a chance to look at not only its results, but how they're reflected in budget choices that they ultimately make. Um, it was the experience I had in 2001 that led me to make a recommendation to the then Secretary of Defense Rumsfeld that the time for delivering this product really ought to be later, not sooner. That sure, you get your strategy done, but it's only when you've gone through and concluded that budget review that follows that you really understand whether you like the strategy or not. So I worked with um, several congressional staff to, um, with the Secretary's approval to change that date and move it later so that you would deliver your strategy and your budget product, um, your budget results all at the same time when, that, when, they're, when they're fielded. I, I could see this going one way, or, one way or the other, and so I'm not really here to say with certainty that don't do this later, but I think because administrations are new, because they often don't yet know how those choices are gonna be rendered in terms of budget decisions, Give them the extra few months to take a look and, uh, and deliver the product all at once. So Mark, those are some opening comments Thank for you. me and I look forward to hearing from Christine and, and Rooster. Thanks, Christine. Um, thanks, Amy, that was great. Uh, and I think I'll, I'll try to keep my comments pretty brief um, because Andy and I, he's a former boss of mine and so uh, I agree with a lot of what he had to say. Um, so I thought I would talk a little bit about some of the process issues uh, and then maybe a little bit at the very end of my comments about the substance. And um, I, I think the process really is a very important piece of the entire enterprise, and so I commend CSIS for really taping, taking a deep look at it, uh, going back and looking at sort of our own American experiences, going back to the bottom-up review, but then also looking at what some of our allies and friends do and trying to learn lessons. I think that's very valuable. Particularly because, as Andy said, you you know you have a new team coming in, um, and some of those folks may have been involved in previous QDRs, but many may not have. And I think you know offering the opportunity to give some really structured thoughts is is very helpful. Um, and I will say, as someone who was, um, I participated in many of the QDRs, if if not not quite all of them, uh, but the one that I personally led was QDR 2014, and that was a second term QDR and it absolutely was, um, you know, frankly, an exercise that was more about duty than about creating great new strategy. So I fully agree with the idea that a new team should come in and do a review, but then after that, unless there's a major change in the strategic environment, I would not support doing another strategy review. It's not, it's not useful and just becomes kind of a, a staff drill. Um, so I think that's a particularly useful recommendation. I also think that, um, in general, there's a lot of wisdom to having um, defense strategy reviews being done by a smaller group in a relatively shorter time. Um, if you, I, I think having a smaller group gives you, A, more chance to, I think, to be innovative and to really push the boundaries and to have really deep debates about what, what are the ends that we're trying to achieve, what are some creative new ways to try to uh, achieve those ends, and it can be hard to do that when you have 
huge groups of working groups and panels and what have you. I think the 97 QDR was an example of one that had many, many different panels and sub-panels and it, it really sort of got consumed in some ways uh, by all of the staff exercises. And I think um, it can be when you have very large um, review processes, it can drive you more quickly to that lowest common denominator trap. Uh, I also think that QDRs or defense strategy reviews are a little bit like planning a wedding. They can kind of expand to fill the time available. And as someone who's now been married twice, you know, I know by personal experience that you can spend a whole year planning a wedding, you can spend three months planning a wedding, and at the end of the day, you still wind up married. Uh, so I think in this case, you know, sometimes um, doing it more quickly, particularly if you have a small group who's empowered, can be just as effective uh, and can and streamline the whole thing. That said, I think the challenge with a smaller group and a shorter group um, goes to the issue of buy-in. How do you get buy-in across the senior leadership of the entire department? And as, as Andy said, uh, it's not only the OSD staff, it's not only the chairman and the joint staff, it's very importantly the service chiefs and service secretaries, and frankly it's also the combatant commanders. You really want all of those folks on the same page at the end of the, at the, end of the day. If you're going to A, I think be most effective in implementing your strategy, but also B, be most effective in being able to articulate coherently and co consistently in public what your strategy is. Uh, and I think um, particularly if you're going to have a strategy where there are winners and losers, and if we all agree that it would be useful to have strategies that make real hard choices and make real statements about priorities, there are going to be losers, then it's really important to have buy-in because um, it's very tempting when you're a loser in the strategy and budget process to go outside of the tent and start complaining um, to you know, people who you think can help you on the Hill or in, other, in the defense industri industrial world, for example. So you really, I think, need to find a way to run a tight process, but also make sure that all of your senior stakeholders have a voice in that process and have the opportunity to make their case and to be heard. Uh, because if they are heard, I think there's a greater chance of them being accepting of the results. Not perfect, even if they are, you know, given the stakes, frankly, that are involved in many cases, particularly when you're looking at choices between capacity and capability, those are, you know, very significant. And even um, entities and stakeholders that have been given the opportunity to really talk directly to the secretary about what they believe the choices should be are still going to be tempted to sort of go off the reservation. But, but if you don't give them a real opportunity to make their case, you're definitely going to be fighting a lot more rear guard actions down the road. So I think that's, that's a real challenge with kind of the smaller, tighter process. Um, it's of course important to, to construct a strategy review that's suited to the personality of the individual secretary and the way that person likes to work and the way that person's senior team likes to work. I would offer, um, you know, I think frankly every person who's charged with running one of these major strategy reviews tries to do that and feels like they are trying to set it up in a way that's going to uh, appeal to the secretary and work for that person. Um, I think the harder thing in my experience, both sort of at a direct level but also as an observer, is even when you try to set up the process to work for a particular secretary, it can be challenging to hold that person's attention and to, even when I think a secretary has all of the best intentions of making a strategy review a major uh, focus for him or her, they are going to be pulled in so many different directions. They're going to be pulled over to the White House. They're going to be pulled to go and do trips to do defense diplomacy and so on. They're going to have a lot of issues competing for their time and attention. So finding a way to really keep that secretary and deputy secretary engaged in the process so that it's clear that the people who are running that process on a day-to-day -day are empowered, in my experience, is the bigger challenge. And I would suspect that Secretary Mattis, who is very well known as being a real strategic thinker, is nevertheless struggling with all of the things that are competing for his attention. Um, and, and so I think that's probably a very real issue for this team, as it has been for others. I also think that while it's probably a good thing that Congress has allowed the department to have this new national defense strategy be classified. 
I don't think it's a panacea, and I worry a little bit that folks up on the Hill believe that because it's classified, it's, it's by definition going to be a better, clearer statement of real choices. It's going to do a better job of prioritizing and so on and so on. And I'm not sure that that's really the case because at the end of the day, there's going to have to be an unclassified articulation of this strategy. And allies and friends and adversaries are going to be extremely interested in what that uh, summary has to say. And I think they're, they're clearly going to know that there's a classified version. So they're going to be looking, if the, if the public version comes out and it doesn't upset the apple cart pretty significantly in terms of sort of what the priorities are, I think we're going to find a lot of allies and partners coming to us and saying, is this really what's in the classified version? You know, is this really, where are the hard choices? Back in the defense strategic guidance, you all said you were going to rebalance to Asia and maybe Europe was going to be de-emphasized. Where's the beef? Where are the real choices? And so I think there's going to be quite a lot of pressure on the department to articulate a lot of what's in the real strategy, if you will. So I don't necessarily think that the classified strategy is going to get us out of that box and solve all those problems. Um, two more things I'll, I'll say just in closing. Um, I think this is an opportunity to address, I hope very much that this national defense strategy articulates the force planning construct for the department in, in um, sufficient detail. And I know uh, for, for my part, the formulation that evolved over the last eight years of the idea of we are going to defeat one adversary and deny the other a set of objectives, I personally believe that that language was, uh, did more to confuse, frankly, and obfuscate than it did to clarify. And I hope that the new team will take advantage of this strategy review process to come up with a force planning construct that really is clear, particularly in the classified version, as to what exactly are we going to do. Is it going to be you know, two of something? Is it win, hold, win? Is it one and a half? Is it the Michelin man? I just think that this is a real opportunity to get some clarity on that point. The last thing I would say, I think there, you know, and I wish this team tremendous uh, luck to, uh, to really shake things up and think boldly and push the envelope on strategy. Nevertheless, at the end of the day, you know, strategy implementation happens, you know, where the rubber meets the road, and that's going to be all about the budget and how is the strategy expressed through the budget to the very good points that Andy made. And it seems to me that we still have very significant challenges from a resource perspective. The, the bill that's up in the House and the bill that's in the Senate, I think, are more about wishful thinking in terms of what's achievable and what's going to be spent on the defense budget than, than reality. I think you're, um, you know, we really need to find a way to lift the budget caps, and I wonder if um, the emphasis that Secretary Mattis has made very recently to tell his senior commanders to feel free to speak more openly in public, I wonder if that's kind of opening the curtain a little bit on wanting to try to rally the troops to articulate why it's so important that the defense budget be increased. I hope that's the case. Um, maybe there will be some sort of a one-year deal that will allow the department to get a little bit more money, but you're still going to, I think, see a lot go into OCO. You can't use OCO to fund your base budget and do a lot of the broader priorities. So, so I see the challenge of resources as being a very significant one that I think will um, act as a little bit of a constraint on how bold this new defense strategy is going to be in terms of its thinking. So why don't I stop there? Drew Stone. Thank you, Christine. So, um, so I'm going to kind of come at this from a slightly different standpoint. So the, the first thing I wanted to do is to just give you a, a little bit of background on the, on the QDR process. So in 2001, I was a colonel in the J-8 cranking away doing an analysis for what I had no idea. We were just doing it because that's what we do down there, right? So, um, and the more it's divorced from any kind of context, the, the easier it is to do that and finish by 1800 and go home. So, so that was kind of what we were doing. A couple of years later, I was minding my own business in Quantico, and I got a phone call that said, come up here and interview with uh, Secretary Wolfowitz to be in the QDR. And at that point, I didn't know, but I was going to find out later that there's an old saw in, the, in the Washington that says, if you're picked to do a QDR, it's proof that God hates you. 
and, 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 I, and I think that there's, a, there's an awful lot to that, although I didn't realize it at the time. The other thing I would add is that, that you also have to be very comfortable with contradiction. If you can hold two completely separate things in your head at the same time and not get vertigo, that's a very, very important thing to do if you're trying to execute a quadrennial defense review. You also have to be very comfortable with ambiguity because the, the review that I did, the first one that I did was in 2004 or 5 time frame and we had a co-lead between myself and a civilian uh, named Jim Thomas leading one of these groups and it was phenomenal. It was a great experience for me. And, and I think that a lot of the things that Christine has, has said already about, uh, and Andy, about working in small groups really came to the fore. At the end of the day, the challenge with any kind of review like that is to incentivize the service chiefs to make decisions that are going to be at odds with what their service does. Because at the end of the day, the service chief, his, his uh, uh, measure of merit, if you will, the way the Alumni Association views him is, are we bigger than we were when we started? Have we added manpower and have we added resources, okay? And so please take what I'm saying. It's somewhat tongue-in-cheek, but there's an awful lot of truth to the way this town operates, okay? So you've got to incentivize those seniors to do things. We found that having discussions at the 06 level was really very, very useful. And there was a lot of colonels in, in the services that were willing to sort of go beyond and make big choices. Once you get up to the general officer level, you now assume this mantle of protecting the institution and it becomes more and more difficult to get outside of yourself and to actually be able to make decisions that are good for the department and the country as opposed to just your service. So we talked about personality and process a little bit. In 1993 we did the bottom-up review and Colin Powell was the chairman of the Joint Chiefs. He got them together in the tank one day and on a number of days, but on one particular day, let me back that up, he didn't do anything in the tank. He did all of it in his office because he was afraid it was going to leak. And what he told them is, we are going to come together for this bottom-up review. We are going to be of one voice when we talk to OSD. And they were. And they, that, that review, at the end of the day, even though the Army gave up a lot of force structure, they held on a lot of other things that, uh, um, that were in play at the time. So it's just interesting that he was the first chairman that really took this Goldwater Nichols thing to the next level and sort of exercised his role with the chiefs. In the 2012 strategy review, so I did a QDR in 2004 on the OSD staff. I did one four years later as the head of the Marine Corps um, as under the rubric of no good deed goes unpunished, right? So I'm in command of, a, of an air wing out in, in the Westpac and I get told I'm coming back early so I can run the QDR. I mean, again, proof that God hates you, right? So, so that was a fascinating experience because it was the new administration coming in and they were trying to get their feet on the ground. And as both Christine and Andy have said, that really is the time when you can make a big difference. The challenge, of course, is you don't have the people in place. You don't have the processes in place. And everybody's, you know, there's just a whole lot of intellectual tail sniffing that's going on as everybody's trying to figure out what everybody else is doing here. And so I did that, and then again, no good deed goes unpunished. In 2012, uh, Kath Hicks and I got thrown together to do a strategy review, which was, was different, and to my way of thinking, it was actually very, very effective because the president was involved from the beginning with the COCOMs and the service chiefs. And it was, uh, it, it was fascinating to watch the way his influence, he was influencing the way that they were creating, the way that we were creating this, this strategy, if you will. So as you think about the, the strategy in, in terms of an overarching uh, uh, concept, if you will, or construct, it, it can't, in my mind, be issue focused if it's going to be uh, effective over time. It has to be flexible enough that the operational things and the technical and tactical things that happen underneath it can still happen and yet still support this, this larger strategy. And the challenge to that, to take the budget thing a step further, is look, when we think about the future, we are generally going to get it wrong, right? And that, that seems to be the, the, our track record. But regardless, we're, we budget for it anyway. 
and we program for it. So you've got this, this program, this, this five-year plan that, that Joe Stalin would be proud of, he would really enjoy that process, where we budget things through the Pentagon, and what happens is you make decisions about major end items that you're going to have to live with in your strategy regardless of what, you, what kind of strategic choices you make in the near term, because it takes years to turn this thing one way or another. Um, if you think about the relationship between resources and risk, the question you might ask yourself is, if I create a strategy that is coherent and that is relevant, is that strategy now no longer coherent or relevant if I don't have X level of resources? In other words, is it, is it a valid thing to say, I can't support the strategy, the strategy is broken because I don't have the resources? Or is the strategy relevant, but the risk that you take in trying to execute that strategy is related to the resourcing that you have or that you are capable of getting? In other words, can the strategy be coherent? And my answer is, I would suggest, yes, it is. If you look at the strategy of containment that we had for many, many years, and there's an awful lot to be learned by that, and I'm sure most of you have read NSC 68, but if you haven't recently, I would, I would encourage you to go back and look at it again and see the way it's written. It's actually written in plain English. You can understand it. It's not got a lot of jargon in it. And it's, uh, it was a top secret document. It has since been declassified. You can Google it on the web and sit and read through it. And, uh, and it's, it's fascinating in that it talks about the, the Soviet Union and what it's trying to do. And then it, it has very specific things that the government, that we can do to, uh, to, to counter that. And the kinds of things that it talks about, and there's four big things, right? It says it's, we need to block the expansion of the Soviet Union. We need to expose the false pretenses of the Soviet disinformation, we would call it today. We have to induce the, uh, the uh, retraction of control and influence, specifically looking at the uh, Eastern Bloc. And the last thing is to foster the seeds of destruction within the Soviet system. Can you imagine saying that today? But this is what, in 1950, what went into this document. Now, there wasn't a lot of, you will do this in this particular manner. And this led to what's going to happen uh, down the road here, the Pentomic Army, where we are going to make large trade-offs about Army ground structure to support nuclear weapons in order to support uh, parts of what we're trying to do to contain Soviet influence. But I, I just use that as an example um, of, of how that the process, now the process that, that created this and the process that's going to reinforce this, and I'm sure you're all familiar with the Solarium Project, but that's another great historical study of how President Eisenhower got his entire cabinet and staff to look at the options for confronting, containing the Soviet Union and to come to a consensus that would drive this forward because he inherited the, this from the Truman administration. If you look at that and you say, okay, so that was a successful strategy that the United States had, the strategy of containment. How did, what was the process whereby we created that strategy? And how did it inform the decisions that we made long term? We didn't contain the Soviet Union everywhere in every place. But then you'd have to ask yourself the next question, which is, so why at the same time did we create such an, a, a, an absolute failure of a strategy in Vietnam? Why was that strategy, did, did that turn out so badly? Was it because of the way it was created? Was it because of the assumptions that Johnson and McNamara used as they created that strategy? Was it the notion that, that at the tactical or operational level that firepower and attrition, that you could destroy a village to save it? Were, all those assumptions were implicit in that strategy. So it's, it's important as we think about a process that this is a living thing that you just can't do once and expect that it's gonna, that it is going to, uh, to continue to, to, uh, to, to be relevant, to do great things. The, um, the next thing that I, <laughs> So in my um, uh, interactions with the Congress with regards to how they partner in this, at the end of the day, it seems to me that the Congress is most interested in a strategy that's going to support local business. It's going to support what's being made in their state, the big end items that are being made. 
it's, it's not the norm that you will find this kind of Ike Skelton sort of uh, strategic view of the world and what needs to, and, the, and what the, it, the nation needs to do. Now that's not to say that these are not good people making good decisions, it's just to say, I, I go back to this issue of this incentive structure again. You've got to incentivize people to do things that they generally might not be inclined to do. And when we create a strategy, a new strategy, even if it is a significant break with the past, in other words, that we're going to do something that we haven't been doing or we're going to start doing something different, it's important, I think, to remember that it's managing that ambiguity between the way we've done things before and the way we are going to do things in the future that's really important. You're never going to just get all the old stuff out and put all the new stuff in. It just doesn't work that way. And so I would, I would suggest that that is something to think about. And the, the last thing that I'll leave you with, because I think we've discussed a lot of the, of the specifics about the, about the um, study, is <clears throat> I would ask you to think about this. I, I would suggest that war as a, is now the defining way of human interaction. That warfare has become a social way of dealing with people and nations that is different than it was 50 years ago. Mm -hmm. That no longer is, or do we write, do we should we conceive of the world as generally peaceful with periods of conflict? That conflict is the norm, and if conflict is the norm and peace is the aberration, then what would that do to the way we would think about designing a national security strategy that would be different? The first thing I would suggest we would think about is that the military strategy can no longer be nested inside the national security strategy that the national military strategy has to be developed and the national security strategy together. There's a symbiotic relationship between the two of them because of the ways that war has taken over as this, as this, uh, this metaphor. It is literally an internal institution of the state now. And because of that, it's interleaved in everything that we do in, in our society. If you look at the way we talk, we talk about the war on poverty, the war on drugs. We describe sporting events as, you know, there's a war going down on the, there on the 50-yard line. We, we do that so easily, we don't even know what we're talking, what's different about it. And I would suggest that the other thing that's important to remember, and the Russians have actually put this into some of their writings, is that war in the future is not going to be declared. It's going to simply be an increase in the level of violence. Well, if that's the case, and look at the last couple of wars we've been involved in and the declarations or not that have occurred, whether it was in Vietnam or Korea or wherever it happened to be, this increase in the level of violence is, is something that I think has been sort of normalized and it's something that we ought to think about as we sort of challenge the assumptions that we make when we go, up, when we go about creating a national security strategy that the, the, the thought that this sort of quaint Westphalian notion that we're going to spend these large t t times of peace, and it may have been the fact that in the years gone in, in past we've done that because we didn't know any better. We didn't know what was going on behind the shores, but because of the technology now that we do know that. So there's this constant level of anxiety and this constant level of conflict. So with, you know, with that uh, you know, positive upbeat uh, uh, ending on that whole thing, I would, uh, uh, I, I would agree with uh, all the other things that we have talked about that today with the political side of this, with the secretary driving this. But at the end of the day, there is something to be said for what those of us in uniform understand about planning, which is it's the plan, not the planning, or it's the planning, rather. Because if you want this government of ours to have a coherent worldview, I would suggest that it's, it's incumbent upon each one of us that's involved in these strategy creation, these strategy development things, to add to that. Because that's one of the things that makes this great republic of ours operate the way it does. So, anyway, that's the thoughts. Thank you very much. Let me uh, uh, take advantage of my position here to ask the first uh, question or two, and then we'll open it up uh, to the audience. But I wanted to leverage something that all of you have talked a little about, and that is the relationship with the NSC and the White House, because, um, of course, in theory, the national security strategy should come out first, and then the defense uh, strategy. 
Uh, in the past, that's never happened, mm -hmm. uh, although it looks like it may happen this time. I know that the uh, White House is trying to get the national security strategy out uh, ahead of the uh, national defense strategy. But uh, in 2014 or 2012, or rather, of course, there's a very close connection with the president there, but very often that connection has not been present. So I wanted to ask each of you your, about your thoughts about connecting to the National Security Council and the White House and, and the value there or, or the, the, the difficulties that that brings. I'll, I'll jump in. I mean, I was at the White House. Um, mm -hmm. I remember fondly being on the other end of the secure video teleconference link with Kath Hicks. <laughs> uh, I was the senior director for defense at the NSC during the 2012 uh, defense strategic guidance process. And, and I, uh, like General Schmidl, thought it was a very, you know, I think beneficial process. And in an ideal world, I think you'd, you know, it would be great if we always had a president who was as engaged personally as President Obama had been at that particular review. Um, and, and part of that review, I think, frankly, was driven not by just a desire to sort of put some stakes in the ground um, on kind of geopolitical issues, but also there were, the Defense Department was being directed to take, you know, very large cuts to what it had planned to spend. And, and the, so the strategic guidance process at that time was, you know, partly about rationalizing that. Um, but, but I found that to be hugely beneficial because you had, first of all, you had a president who was personally and directly engaged, who was, um, you know, hearing from the Defense Department leadership about what their views were about what was important, but also was putting out some views of his own about what he thought the, you know, what direction he thought the country needed to be going in. And it was really, I think, pretty unique in that, you know, there were multiple meetings in the Oval Office with the President, the Chairman, the Secretary, um, the Under Secretary, the Vice Chairman, where they would debate issues about, you know, which, which, do we have to prioritize a particular region in the world? If so, you know, what regions is it gonna be? What, what should, you know, we didn't really call it the force planning construct in front of President Obama, but we did talk about, you know, do, is this idea of being able to do two major regional contingencies nearly simultaneously still the right yardstick to use, for example? Um, and of course, we worked very closely with the, the NSC staff as well, um, and, and folks like General Schmidl and Kath. And so I think that having that really tight connective tissue can be hugely beneficial, particularly if you're contemplating making a real change strategically, you know, either on geopolitical issues or on major invest investment issues. Um, you know, we, we made a pitch, frankly, in the run-up to the 2014 QDR to try to redo that because there were still a lot of us around who saw how useful that was and it fell on completely deaf ears. In part, I think, because we really didn't have the kind of big strategic questions to grapple with. Um, I, I think it would be less, be while I certainly think you always need to have coordination between the NSC staff in particular and DOD as they go through simultaneously or nearly simultaneously the NSS and the defense strategy review, if it's just at the level, you know, with all due respect to, you know, my, my current, to the folks doing it now and, you know, having had the job then, I think if it's, if it's just about connectivity between the senior director for defense and the undersecretary or whatever, it's, it's useful, but it's a little bit less valuable because you don't, because at that level, you're probably really talking about what those individuals think the right answers are as opposed to engaging the people who are going to be making the decisions. Um, so I, I think the best way to do it is to really get the, the president and the cabinet level officials to be engaged, but that's hard. So, so here's an example from that from the other side of it. So how I got involved in this is I, I ran General Dempsey's transition team as he became the chairman, right? So we spent a lot of time flying on airplanes and talking about stuff. And, and a couple months after he became the chairman, I was back at Cyber Command as the deputy up there, and he called and said, hey, uh, we're going to put this strategy review together, and I want to... I want you to, to lead this from the joint staff perspective because I of the way the discussions that we've had. So, so I'm trying to channel some of the things that he's thinking about. And but I found myself, quite frankly, on the weekends in OSD, particularly in Cape, using their analysts to run science projects and to run uh, excursions on Army end strength and other things that were just too nuclear and too radioactive to get outside. Now, the issue that, that uh, Christine mentioned about resources, so th that was the time now that we, you know, that, that the BCA caps are in place, there's money coming down, 
And I got it, the world's coming to an end. But the other side of this is when resources become less available, it really helps to focus you on what's really important. And one of the conversations that we had during that particular evolution was the extent to which the services could continue to do what they'd been doing at, that, at those levels of funding. And uh, the president got, the, and I got this from one of the service chiefs, he got them in the office and said to them, can you, one at a time, support what's in this, this strategy? Well, the challenge with all that is at the end of the day, the services, part of their, of their sort of rationale, the reason d'etre, is that they can support what the COCOMs are asking for. So that there's, there's, a, there's a real dichotomy, there's a tension here between wanting to support that, wanting to seem like you are doing everything and being everywhere. But, but interestingly enough, the discussions that came back that I was part of, uh, that the service chiefs brought back from the White House about the strategy were actually pretty substantive. And they were, and, the, and I gotta tell you that not everybody agreed with some of the proposals in there about what, the, what was going to happen to the, to the military, what, what it was gonna be principally used for or not used for. Um, but it, it, again, there was a, it, a very healthy dialogue about this. The last meeting that I remember when we briefed, when Kath and I, and we had at this point, brought Lisa Disberman from the J8 to do all this analytics stuff. And we briefed uh, Secretary Panetta and all the underers and all the service chiefs and the, you know, the usual cast of thousands. And this, this is kind of one of the tethered goat things, right? So you get up in front there and just take shots for an hour. But one of the questions that Secretary Panetta asked, he said, okay, at the end of the day, you know, we want to pivot to the Pacific. And he said, I need to know specifically what it is that we would do that would show the world that, that our strategy is changing. So I took a deep breath and I gave him like six things, all of which the services hated. And you know, the CNO and the chief of staff of the Air Force were looking at me with daggers in their eyes. And I mean, the whole, it was, okay, so you want to do this? So here's what you want to do. Well, there's a million, a million good reasons why you can't do that. So, and that was the most flexible program that I have seen interaction-wise. When we did the 2004 QDR, you know that funny Michelin Man thing? I hate to say this, but I have some ownership in the way that came out, although I'm not much of an Andy Warhol kind of sketcher, but the, that Rumsfeld took that concept to President Bush, and Bush said to him, I am not going, this, this is what, what he told us when he came back, I am not going to be the president that says this country can't do two big things at once. And that, because that was many years, 2004, that 13 years ago, we were already saying that if, if you are going to execute two major contingencies the way the COCOMs envision this, you don't have the forces to do that. And then, because when we started this back in the 90s, we realized we couldn't do them simultaneously, so we did them sequentially. So, but we're still whistling past the graveyard. We're still not coming to address the principal way of, of the, the principal problem, which is if you continue to look at solving these problems with conventional military means, you are going to continue to come up short. And whether you want to or not, you'll have to because you won't get any more money from the Congress if you don't. So I mean, there's a lot of things at play in here. And uh, so. I'm gonna make two brief points on this. I think um, Christine and, and Rooster have covered most of the, the, the sort of context. But the first point I think I, I would like to make is, is one of coupling. I think there's no question that these need to be tightly coupled. That is the debate that's taking place in the Defense Department and the larger debate that involves the President and his or her key team. Um, and my experience has been that the cabinet officer, the secretary of defense, has always ensured that the president is well informed of these debates as they're unfolding, mm -hmm. uh, always ensured. Now, different presidents have taken different levels of interest. Um, I think the 2012 cases is illustrative of a president being deeply involved. But I certainly know from the 2001 uh, experience that I had, that the Secretary of Defense would weekly go over to bring the President up to date on what the deliberations were. We'd build you know, basic materials that would help frame that discussion. It wasn't intended ever to sort of take the President through all the gory details of, of you know, where this issue was or that, but it was about 
you know, framing the, the big choices and ensuring that the president is com comfortable. Coupling is critical. I think coupling, in my mind, more critical than the timing of the respective documents. I thought your, your report got this about right. You know, it, it, it really doesn't matter to me whether the Defense Department is out of head or the national security strategy or not, as long as I know that there's a tight coupling between the president and, and his or her team and the, other, you know, the, and the defense leadership and the State Department and others. That's point one. The other one, one is timing. I, I think the 2012 example is a very good one, but I think we should remember that this is a president who is now in the fourth year of his first term. Fourth year, not first year. Mm -hmm. yeah. And that, because the president had the opportunity to benefit from the debates, had been through various experiences, was looking at the world and what his legacy might be and so forth. Um, I think by that point, the president was able to be heavily involved and really guide that. I wonder um, whether a president in the first year of a term would be able to ha be as heavily involved as President Obama was, say, in 2012. So I think timing on these is critical. And, and you know, I think we should sort of understand that in the first year of any administration, the president is going to have many choices, many demands on, 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 on the schedule and so forth. And as long as the first point, the coupling is there, you know, whether, whether the president is as deeply involved or could even be, you know, nearly as heavily involved as, say, President Obama was, you know, I, I think uh, less important to me. But, uh, but the coupling issue is critical. Mark, if I can make a point. So about the 2001 QDR, the other interesting thing about that timing-wise is the, a lot of the deliberations, and Andy, correct me if, I, if I'm wrong here, but from what I remember, a lot of the deliberations le led up to 9-11. After 9-11, there was a break in the sort of the worldview here, and there was a lot of uh, reevaluation of things, right? So you could look back at 9-11 now, 14 years, or I mean, 14, 16, 17, 18 years later, and talk about how things have changed, but you could actually ask yourself the question, to what extent has the strategic um, environment truly changed in a way that was so fundamental based on 9-11? And, and the answer may be that it didn't truly change and that a lot of the deliberations that occurred prior to 9-11 were actually very valid about the world view and what was going to happen. It's just to say that sometimes when we are trying to create strategic documents and to think strategically and take this long view, we get interrupted by the current events that have such an impact that we have difficulty realizing that you know the you know the, the reason we're here in the swamp you know that, that surrounded by alligators we came to drain the swamp kind of thing. So you know, uh, I don't know. I, and any very other very true, and I think a very good comment. I mean, and as Christine knows, we were working together at the time, but. Uh, uh, it, it, it was on the, the, the steps of the river entrance on the morning, on Wednesday morning of September 12th, 2001, that I got the instructions from the Secretary of Defense to finish the, the preparation of this review um, quickly because we've got other things to do. In other yeah. words, we have a war fight. Yeah. And uh, and there were, no doubt there were you know that was going to lead and that kicked off a whole series of other activities of of reviewing the kind of choices that we were making. But uh, so we uh, you know in terms of uh, that effort, uh, the Pentagon was still on fire. Um, I recall uh, uh, quickly um, declassifying the document, taking it home, yeah. and finishing it, yeah. and uh, and then we were off to other things. Great. Well, I have lots more questions I could ask, but uh, to give our audience their uh, opportunity here. Um, uh, questions from the audience. All right. And back there. Oh. Thank you. Uh, Phoenix Huang from Hong Kong Phoenix TV. And uh, I just want to be a little bit specific, specific about uh, on China. So, uh, qu um, Given the fact that China this year has many significant uh, achievements, such as uh, uh, aircraft carriers and uh, rocket forces, 
and uh, anti-career missiles. Even uh, a few weeks ago, the China has commissioned its uh, uh, fifth generation of the steel fighter J-20. So which of these weapon system do you think that can promote the, mo promote the most threat to make the US to rethink about its Asia Pacific strategy? Just give you a hint that uh, some say the US fleet would leave the first island chain defense to Japan and fall back all the way to Guam, um, affected by Chinese growing sea power, specifically uh, by the Chinese anti-ship capability. So what's your thoughts on that? Anyone? Thank you. Well, I, I know you've all thought about China a lot. Anyone want to go first? I'll, I'll leap in. You know, I think um, you'll probably see in the national defense strategy, well, let me step back. You know, I think there's been a, a very strong appreciation in the Department of Defense for some time now as to the scope and scale of Chinese military modernization um, in, in all of the domains, air, maritime, uh, cyber, space, ground, et cetera. And, you know, there's such an appreciation for the significance of that modernization that the department puts out its, you know, report, its annual report on Chinese military power every year. And that's really the place where the department goes into detail about specific weapon systems and their implications for the U.S. military. Um, you know, I don't think that the national defense strategy will do that in that level of depth, but you'll certainly see, I think, you know, I would expect to see a, a discussion in both the section that addresses the security environment, but also the one that talks about what are our, what are our objectives, what are our goals, um, what are we trying to do around the world. I would imagine you'll see a discussion of, of our approach to China, uh, as, and, and probably in the context of sort of the department's thinking about um, anti-access area denial kind of challenges more broadly, and certainly um, those, are, those are challenges that we see all around the globe, not just in the Asia Pacific. Um, so I'm sure you'll see a discussion of it. Again, I don't think that this is a particularly new um, issue for the department, and it's one I think that is something that the department looks at very closely. So if, if I could, one of the things that I think is that this your question brings out that is really important is that we don't confuse tactical capabilities with strategic thinking or with a strategy. Okay, so when we talk about China, a lot of times that conversation, at least the ones that I have been in, they tend to be dominated by folks in uniform and we tend to talk about how we're going to defeat certain tactical Chinese systems, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. What it seems to me is really called for here is for us to back away from this thing a little bit and to, A, realize that the, a strategy against China is going to be unique in and of itself and it's going to be different than the strategy against Russia or anywhere else. That strategy, that this particular strategy is not a one-size-fits-all. The second thing is that we have to set that strategy in a context and we have to understand the operating logic, if you will, of the Chinese and the logic that they are using in their worldview to create the strategy that they have. When we understand that logic, we can then invert it, turn it on its ear and use it and apply it against the Chinese, but we can't ever get there until we understand what that is, what it is that's driving them. The other part of this is that there is a social piece to this whole thing. There is a social complexity to any strategy, and it is especially important in the case of the Chinese that we understand how all of this knits together in, in a way that gives us insight, again, into the logic of the problem from a whole of government perspective, which is why I made the point before that the military strategy needs to be developed concurrently with the national security strategy in some kind of process because what tends to happen is we, my view, we create a national security strategy and then we go try to solve the problems that occur inside of that strategy by going first to the military because it's the easiest thing to do, it's the most effective in the near term, and it gives us a sense that we're doing something and accomplishing something when in fact we, we may not be. So um, that I would suggest, and the, the last thing I would mention on China is that I think it's important as we start to look at a strategy there, this whole notion of challenging every assumption that's out there 
because I, I think that we find that a lot of those assumptions may be rooted in historical uh, um, anecdotes that are no longer relevant. And when we think about this strategy, the very last thing I would leave you with is the real art form here is to connect a concept to practice. Okay, so as we, we're not creating a strategy that's just a concept. We are creating a strategy that has a concept that has connections into practice because it's the practice, the execution of that strategy that in the end of the day, that at the end of the day will actually define or reinforce what that strategy is. So. Anything you want to add? I, no, I think okay. we can go ahead. One, one thing I would note is a conversation that we had beforehand and that is the tension between a focus on uh, high-end challenges like China and Russia and the need to have forces engaged day-to-day -day around the world for crisis response and humanitarian assistance and power projection. And strategists tend to focus on the high-end threats because those are uh, the, the most threatening, but the day-to-day -day demands push the services to uh, increase their forces uh, to try to meet those demands that the the president and the, the world keep putting on them. Okay, another question. Uh, okay, over there in the corner. Uh, hi, uh, Jesper Vandenberg, uh, ISEC student at GMU. Uh, I just briefly, oh, sorry. Uh, I just briefly wanted to uh, ask a question about um, how important is uh, consistency in strategy formulation versus flexibility? Uh, General Schmidl, you talked about uh, looking back at the strategy of containment, um, but obviously, you know, that strategy might be missing, you know, a cybersecurity component or, or something like that. So I was just uh, wondering on your comments on consistency versus uh, flexibility in strategy formulation. Thank you. If I, I can give you 30 seconds on that. I think that you need to look at that at different levels that there's a level of consistency at a potentially at a strategic level that is extremely important to the strategy, but that trying to take that same level of consistency at a high level and drive it all the way down to the tactical level is, a, uh, is, is fraught with peril. That the flexibility you need is, is at the tactical and operational level. The consistency that I think you need is at the strategic level. I'm gonna take and, and and say something very similar, but in a little different way, uh, which is I'm, you know, I'm in, I'm in, 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 in complete agreement with General Schmidl on this. Uh, I think the consistency you're looking for <clears throat> is found in basic objectives, and that's what I was trying to highlight in uh, my opening remarks. That I think we're at a point now where some of the basic objectives or goals, ends if you will, that are associated with the strategy are up for debate in a way they haven't been since the end of the Cold War. Uh, it, and so we're looking for a consistency of purpose. Um, you're looking for uh, coherence in those objectives. Um, you're looking for a definition or, or a statement of America's role in the world. What do we want to accomplish? But inside of that, as General Schmidl pointed out, there are any number of different variations on themes, a different, we often we call these means. The, the way that you would approach you know, and, and pursue basic objectives, you would, you would not only uh, uh, expect, but you would seek differences because of course, uh, and change over time, because of course your, your situation or your circumstances are going to change. And so for me, I, I think what we really, I want to be focused on now is where does this administration come out in terms of its posi position about America's role in the world? It may still and, and could well affirm sort of the consistency that, uh, that we've seen over the last 20 years. But I think we also um, um, should recognize that some of those foundational elements are now up for debate in ways that they haven't been um, mm -hmm. for a long, long time. Okay, question, let's see, we'll move over to that side there. Two opportunities, okay. Uh, hello, my name is Nicholas Hasco, I work at the State Department. 
Um, I wanted to ask this group because it represents sort of, uh, I think, a lot of knowledge in terms of the transformation of how we've approached some of the problems since September 11th um, to, about security sector assistance. So uh, sort of a vital component that we seem to have found in post, specifically in post-conflict environments, Iraq, Afghanistan, I think the increasingly the debate is in, in, in Syria. Um, and our approach as a civ mill group has come under a bit of critique. Um, I think about the Special Inspector General for Afghanistan Reconstruction Lessons Learned Report that was just released looking at the last 15 years in Afghanistan and how civilians in the military have worked together to build Afghan military police justice institutions. Um, could you comment on you know, where you see that going in this process as sort of a strategic consideration building partner forces? I was going to say that. It, what you is know, your job? Yeah, you know, you know, God hates you if you get assigned to a QDR <laughs> multiple times. You also know God hates you if you have to work on security sector assistance, which was also something else I got to work on when I was at the NSC. Um, but you know, in all seriousness, um, I certainly think that um, building partner capacity, you know, which is another sort of label that we use for it in DoD, is a very important. Uh, tool that we have in our strategic toolkit to try to help us meet some of our ends and our objectives as a nation, you know, and that we, we've learned through hard, very hard experience that um, it doesn't make sense to always do everything ourselves. Um, not only is that very resource intensive, but it's also sometimes not the most uh, it's not the best way to achieve a sustainable resolution of a situation, which I think has led us to doing a lot of the good security sector assistance work that we've done. So I certainly hope, and I, and I think you know, to Andy's discussion at the outset about this administration and whether they will in fact make some very different choices about what our objectives are, it will be very interesting to see where they come out on some of the things that I consider to be more traditional pillars of our um, of our national security strategy and, and security sector assistance and BPC is certainly a part of that. Assuming that they do in some way, I think, find a home for that, which I suspect that they will, um, you know, I think that to me the two real questions there are, one, you know, why haven't our efforts to build partner capacity been more successful given all of the time, all of the resources, all of the experience we have doing it. I think we still seem to have a lot of problems and, and the sort of the need to completely rebuild the Iraqi army in 2014 is a good example. Um, so, you know, is there, is there anything more we can learn from, from our experiences as to how to do that more effectively? And I don't know what the answers are, but I think we should be pressing ourselves to ask the question. The, the second big thing that leaps out at me is this other question of whether the table has tilted too definitively towards the Department of Defense and away from the State Department. That was certainly the very bitter bureaucratic battle that was being fought when I was at the NSC. Um, you know, I, I probably wasn't objective as a detailee from the Defense Department. I, I, I felt that we were trying to be pretty open and cooperative with the State Department and a lot of the reason why DOD was getting more authorities from Congress and more resources from Congress was more about the fact that I think fairly or unfairly folks up on the Hill often feel that DOD is more competent than the State Department, more effective than the State Department, again, fair or unfair. Um, but I think, you know, I've noticed recently there has been a resurgence of voices making the argument that really there is a fundamental imbalance in the set of authorities and that, that a lot of that responsibility needs to shift back to the State Department. So it will be interesting to see if that debate plays out at all in this review that's going on right now. So <clears throat> part of the challenge is if you think about the way that uh, T.E. Lawrence uh, expressed this in the Seven Pillars of Wisdom, right? He said, and I may get the words a little bit wrong, but basically he said it is better to do things poorly the Arab way than to do them very well the British way. And, and you know, it's, it's, it's just axiomatic, it's true. And what Lawrence was trying to, to make sure that his British colleagues understood was that what he was doing in the Arabian Peninsula in 1916, 17, and 18 was not about trying to turn the Arabs into British soldiers. It was about trying to to let the Arabs do what it was that they were best at. He modified his tactics, he modified everything based on 
the way that the Arabs had been historically fighting. So there's something to be learned there. The other thing is that we, we keep, we, and I'll use the big we, the services, the ground forces, there still is a very, um, uh, there still is a sense that a lot of these kinds of missions that we're talking about, security missions, are still lesser included parts of a larger, more kinetic, more aggressive way of fighting, of fighting wars. And that is not a, a necessarily an institutional criticism as much as it is a, a comment on the sizes of the force and what they have to do things with. But that, that is still part of what's going on. To the, to the issue of the Iraqi army, uh, Christine's absolutely right. But if you go back to the beginning, the decision was made by a civilian appointee to disband the Iraqi army. And it was arguably one of the worst decisions that was made in that entire revolution. So just, just a thought on that. And the very last thing is, I would suggest that when you think about these kinds of things, doing things by, with, and through allies, which we've mentioned in multiple QDRs, one of the things that makes those operations successful is, or the thing that does, is strategic patience. And it's the one thing that we don't have a lot of in the United States. And it's realizing that when this gets off the front page of the Washington Post and it gets into a long term, there is a level of operational things that, uh, that need to be done over time. And we experience this in some of the successful insurgencies, counterinsurgencies that we've been involved in. It just takes time for these things to evolve if they are to be ex if they're executed correctly. So um, to answer your question, I think that's a couple. I don't think that strategy can be an embedded part of this, it needs to be part of it, but how it is linked or how it is conjoined to the national security strategy is, is important in terms of its place and the amount of emphasis you place on it. And that, from my viewpoint, has been the biggest single thing. Do you place a lot of emphasis on that mission or a smaller part? And that, that, that's the art in, in that. So. And you want to add any? Last word? I think word? it was well said. Okay, well, I think we've hit our, our time. I want to thank you very much uh, for coming, and please uh, thank our panelists for their uh, contributions this morning.